uh, we are open for discussion. Um, so, I will just go in order of how things are here. Uh, center 1207, Jawaharlal Nal Institute of Technology, Borawan. Adiabatic saturation process is represented on the psychrometric chart by an inclined line. Yes. Along the constant enthalpy line. But uh, how, how it is adiabatic saturation? Because uh, during that process there is a change in enthalpy and dBT and omega is also changing. So how can we say that it is an adiabatic saturation? Please clarify. See, on the psychrometric chart, the, uh, you said that which line was the same as which line? The WBT and H line. Is that what you claimed? No, it is shown by it is shown along a along a constant enthalpy line. See, the constant wet bulb temperature line is drawn as the adiabatic saturation line, and that line is not the same as the constant enthalpy line. There is a very very small difference and the difference is arising because you know definitely it is not the same and it is only slightly different because you add a small amount of omega and it does not create so much difference in the enthalpy. But the adiabatic saturation line is not the same as the constant enthalpy line. So, they are different. It is just that when they are plotted they seem to be so close by that you think they are the same, but they are not the same line. So, people normally will plot a small deviation, okay, but they are not the same lines. Okay. So, some people may say, okay, go ahead and take it as, as nearly the same, but it is not really the same. Uh, what is the practical application of adiabatic saturation process? So, see, from the practical point of view, what is uh, known is that let us say you want the state of air at any point. Okay. So, that means I need to know the specific humidity because I need to calculate all my um, uh, air conditioning processes using my specific humidity. Now, if I need to know the specific humidity, I need to know the partial vapor pressure for water vapor and I have two methods to do it. Okay, one is the using the dew point and one is using the uh, wet bulb temperature. Now, it turns out that the wet bulb temperature is the more practical method because that can be easily done and that is why you know you need to know what the wet bulb temperature is. The adiabatic saturation is very close to the wet bulb process and hence they teach you that. Otherwise, from the practical point of view, it is the wet bulb temperature that is always measured and using you know um, uh, standard empirical relationship, you get to PV and once you know PV, all other psychrometric calculations can be done easily. So, from the pra practical standpoint of view, the wet bulb temperature is what is needed. So, that is the importance from the practical point of view. Thank you. 1148. If you have a question, go ahead. The psychrometric chart is defined for one atmospheric pressure. If the pressure is more than one atmospheric, how to calculate? Yeah, as I said, you know, during my lecture, that as long as you um, stick to the steam tables, you don't really require the psychrometric chart. But if you want to draw the psychrometric chart for any other pressure than one atmosphere, you are free to do so because all you need is to measure the barometric pressure at that point. If it is more than one atmosphere, everywhere in the formula where the total pressure comes in, substitute that and get a new chart. So, people do this uh, for various pressures and you have psychrometric charts for various pressures. So, that is not a big deal. So, as I told you for the psychrometric chart, all you require is somewhere you need the P total, you substitute your pressure at that point, you will get all your constant H lines, your constant W lines, they will just be slightly different than what is there at one atmosphere. Thank you. 1205, go ahead if you have a question. Like carrier equation, you have other equations also. Yes. So, this carrier equation that you have given, yes. was it derived under adiabatic condition or by actual condition? No, this carrier equation is just purely an empirical relationship. So, it is not assuming anything else. Okay. So, it is a purely empirical relation. On psychrometric chart, you have the constant enthalpy deviation lines also that you did not discuss. Yes, I mean I have not discussed every possible line out there. Okay, so there are uh, small deviation lines which you can uh, try to uh, you know because if there are too many lines, there are there is a clutter and people normally talk about you know constant enthalpy lines and the deviation lines to get your wet bulb temperature. But you know, I didn't discuss all of those because I didn't really want to get into psychrometric charts. But as long as you can use your steam tables, I think that is probably good enough. Thank you. Uh, for evaporative cooling, there is a term enthalpy potential. 
like you know temperature potential and all that so this enthalpy potential term when you discuss that adiabatic saturation temperature the evaporation concept in the desert coolers so that enthalpy potential term uh, could have been discussed by right sir okay see um I am not so familiar with this enthalpy potential, but what I can tell you definitely is that if you are using a desert cooler, there is going to be a difference in your omegas, and the greater the difference in your omegas, and the greater the potential, that is the greater the potential for uh, the dry air to pick up more moisture. And if you can pick up more moisture, and uh, you uh, use that much energy to convert that moisture, I think the cooler you can become. Probably that is where. all this potential comes in that is there is some kind of a driving force is how people try to look at it but finally if you are very dry you can put in more moisture and that is going to help you uh, have a better desert cooler i think that is all that is probably there i myself are, am not so familiar with these terms like enthalpy potential etc but i can tell you what the uh, rough principle would be for such a case thank you 047 In the calculation of wet bulb temperature that you are told by experimental method, uh, that uh, reference is taken that of bulb or with that of air, because you told that that uh, equilibrium is reached, then only the uh, temperature is calculated. Wet bulb temperature is calculated. Uh, my question is whether the reference is taken as the bulb or that of air. Yes, yeah, see wh what you are going to measure is directly the temperature of the wet bulb. so technically as you see you are really measuring the temperature of the bulb not of the air so i think that is where the problem arises so you are actually measuring the steady state temperature of the bulb that is that is the main thing thank you is there any empirical relation available to calculate the wet bulb temperature based on dry bulb temperature see hey. the wet bulb temperature is uniquely determined by your dry bulb temperature and your and your vapor pressure so using the same correlation okay with pv and uh, dbt you can calculate your wet bulb temperature it will only be a trial and error process you will need to find out uh, or guess a wet bulb temperature get pv sat at the wet bulb temperature substitute and see if you get the right pv if not change your guess it's a trial and error process but you can use the same equation for it of course for a particular dbt there will be lot of wet bulb temperatures it will only depend on your vapor pressure so for a particular dry bulb temperature you cannot have a unique wet bulb temperature you will have a multitude of wet bulb temperatures thank you so why the speed of a supersonic aircraft is measured in terms of mach number only why not uh, kilometer per hour or uh, miles per hour well actually it it is uh, it can be measured very well in in terms of kilometers per hour or miles per hour there is absolutely no uh, reason why it cannot be measured in kilometers per hour and so on it's just that at a particular elevation let us say if the aircraft is flying there is a certain temperature at that elevation corresponding to which there is a certain uh, speed of sound that exists at that elevation and it may be little bit uh, of a convention to mention the speeds in terms of mach numbers but once you know the elevation where the aircraft is flying and the speed of sound corresponding to that elevation you can always convert the mach number in terms of the actual velocity namely so many kilometers per hour and so on and vice versa so there is no hard and fast uh, rule that it has to be one way or the other over to you thank you here in the morning we have assumed that adiabatic system okay uh, uh, during the derivation of that mach number related problem there instead of assuming it as adiabatic if it is some other process right i said okay non adiabatic constant pressure or constant volume based system where heat is transferred or it is lost from the system in that cases what might be the possible changes in the final equation uh actually physically it is incorrect to include such effects because uh, physically when you are talking about a sound wave propagation the process is actually isentropic uh, because there is hardly any time for heat transfer so under that assumption it makes sense to talk about the sound wave propagation so i think my understanding is that the process actually that occurs is as close to being isentropic as possible and therefore uh, 
at least my understanding would be that there is no point talking about uh, a heat transfer type process uh, occurring uh, to, to make it any ph physically meaningful. Sir, you told that enthalpy it is only a function of, yes sir, enthalpy is only a function of temperature, you told sir in your session. Sir, uh, is it true for all the processes or is it true only for ideal gases? Yes, uh, I think you have already learned last week that as far as ideal gases are concerned, enthalpy is a function only of temperature. So, you can safely assume whether a gas is ideal or not, based on that you can decide whether to go for this assumption. Now, what we can see normally is that at very low pressures, even water vapor behaves very close to an ideal gas and hence this ideal gas assumption can be brought in and H can be roughly shown to be only a function of temperature. There is a small effect of pressure, but that we neglect and we go ahead. So, it is as close to an ideal gas at these low pressures. Thank you. Sir, if a top wave is moving in certain medium, sir, okay, if that medium suddenly changes to say infinite density, sir. So, what happens to the shock, whether they collapses or changes? Well, if, if, the, if the shock remains as a shock, uh, you will still have a uh, density jump across the shock, whether the medium into which it is moving is at a lower value of density or higher value of density. So, I think the shock will not really necessarily lose its identity is, is what I can think of. Uh, for water vapor, if it is reference temperature is 0 degree centigrade, in that case, what will be the reference temperature to calculate the enthalpy of the air? The reference temperature for dry air is taken as 0 degree centigrade. Uh, again, this is for ease of calculation and we would have preferred that the reference temperature for water vapor is also at 0 degree centigrade. Uh, however, you realize that there is a problem that you know at that temperature okay you do not have a liquid vapor interface and it is only at 0 0.01 degrees that you start to have a liquid vapor interface that is with the triple line. So, it does not matter we just say okay, 0 0.01 degrees and 0 degrees there is not too much difference. So, uh, saturated liquid at 0 0.01 degrees is a reference 0 for water and uh, temperature is equal to 0 Celsius is a reference for dry air. So, this is the convention by which most psychrometric charts are made. Thank you. 1105, go ahead. First question is, uh, what are the physical significance of uh, wet bulb temperature and uh, dew point temperature? Sir? And question number two, so you have, uh, you have showed on the uh, formula for the, uh, to determine the uh, vapor pressure. So, there are so many uh, formulas to, to, to determine vapor pressure. So, which one is correct and which one is uh, uh, valid, valid reasons you have to take it for consideration to solve the problem, sir. Okay, so I mean I do not know what you would mean by a physical significance. See, what you really need for calculating most air conditioning uh, uh, processes is that you need to know what are the comfort condition and hence you need to know what is the relative humidity. So, for as far as we are concerned, the dew point temperature is there purely to calculate the omega so that we can get the relative humidity and how much water vapor is being carried by the air. So, that is why we need the dew point temperature. If someone wants to make dew out and you know remove uh, water out of the air for a separate process you know where you know in deserts people want to get water out then you would require a practical practically the dew point temperature for that purpose. Otherwise, in our case we are using it purely to get uh, omega and similarly the wet bulb temperature is also to get omega. Both these quantities are there only so that we can get omega and using that we will get our relative humidity and this is used for all our uh, calculations. Now, regarding which equation to use for the wet bulb temperature, <coughs> these are all empirical uh, relations and it is uh, not so easy to tell you know which one would be the best fit, but we would prefer to go with the carrier equation. It is a reasonably well known equation and that is why we are preferring it. I do not think that we have really uh, some kind of solid proof that this is far better than the other one or something. It is just that we are going by a really well known equation which is the carrier equation. Thank you. Sir, normally shock wave application uh, I have that in aerospace department only. So, where we can find in mechanical departments of this shock wave application? 
and for what mac number in mechanical department we are working uh, yeah you are right typically the compressible flow and uh, applications of shock waves really fall under uh, basically a high speed flow category uh, situation which mechanical engineers typically do not uh, deal with you are absolutely right about that uh, normally mechanical engineers do deal with incompressible flow which is usually a low speed flow where you normally do not see these kinds of uh, phenomena only when you are talking about situations like for example propulsion type application where you have a nozzle uh, or maybe even some sort of a wind tunnel application where you are using a supersonic wind tunnel that's where you will need these kinds of ideas but on the whole i will agree with you that mechanical engineering need not always uh, get into these kinds of situations hypersonic flow means what is the mach number uh, yeah hypersonic flow typically as a rule of thumb people will say that when the mach number goes beyond 5 Uh, if it is uh, mach number of 5 or more we consider the situation to be hypersonic and this is purely based on rule of thumb there is no reason to say that if it is uh, 4.85 it's not going to be hypersonic so roughly speaking above 5 is when people will take the situation to be hypersonic thank you uh, sir while designing any conditioning systems we'll speak about something by a by bypass factor of coils right sir So I want to know what does by bypass factor means? Yeah, I mean uh, there is a question. In fact, the last question in the exercises with the bypass factor. So what really happens is, of course, I mean the moist air is flowing over coils which have the refrigerant flowing in it, and uh, the coil temperature is uh, really low, and you expect that the moisture will condense on to the coils, and hence the specific humidity will decrease. now not every part of the uh, moist air is in contact with the coils because the coils are not you know of infinite area and what we just assume is that after passing over the coils the air will again mix and there is one common uh, temperature and specific humidity now the bypass factor is just purely um, uh, you know a fudge factor which we will say is how much amount of um, uh, air has actually been in contact with the coils so if all the air has bypassed the coils then we say if the bypass factor is 1 which means the coils have had no effect on the um, on the moist air and it just leaves with the same temperature and pressure same temperature and specific humidity if the bypass mm-hmm. factor is 90% or 0.9 we say okay 10% has really come in contact with the coil and its temperature has gone down to that of the coil and hence when we mix you know it will be uh, a mixture of the net air plus whatever has come in contact with the coil and so on if there is zero bypass it means everything was in contact with the coil and uh, it has reached the coil temperature so the bypass is just a fudge factor telling us how much probably air was actually in touch with that uh, coil so that is all about it thank you sir what is the mach number for uh, incompressible flow sir so the the question is about uh, mach number for an incompressible flow uh, so this, this this answer depending on who you are asking you will get this answer but roughly speaking uh, for incompressible flow the mark number tends to zero it's a very very small uh, small value so uh, you know technically speaking you can say that if the mark number is less than 0.3 we end up uh, treating the flow to be incompressible but if it is truly incompressible flow the mark number is actually very very small tending to zero thank you 1128 gnid nagpur go ahead uh, sir in psychrometry we have humidity ratio that degree of saturation and relative humidity and one more term i have come across that is mass of water vapor per meter cube of dry air so out of these four terms related with moisture content we generally do emphasize on relative humidity like in air conditioning calculations we take relative humidity in weather data also we have the data related with relative humidity so why it is so why other terms are not generally taken yeah this is uh, purely a matter of how comfortable we are so for example the relative humidity gives you an idea of how moist the air is so if it is 100% uh, relative humidity you know that you know it's really humid as far as it can uh, take and you can no longer push moisture in it whereas if i give you specific humidity there is clearly no clue on 
what net moisture can uh, you know get in. And since the relative humidity is expressed in some kind of a percentage, okay, it is uh, pretty, uh, it gives a pretty good idea of how dry the weather is and we seem to be comfortable with it. So, that is why for comfort conditions, just to tell how moist the air is, relative humidity is a very, very uh, you know convenient quantity. However, let me tell you that if you want to do calculations, it is the specific humidity which is important because that is why or on the basis of which we calculate all our enthalpy. So, for calculation purposes, the specific humidity turns out to be a better or more convenient quantity, whereas to tell people about how comfortable things are, relative humidity turns out to be a better quantity. Thank you. Yes, sir, my second question, at the atmospheric pressure, how can you say water vapor will behave as a perfect gas? Yes, so uh, at, as such, at this point at least definitely the water vapor is not at atmospheric pressure, it is very, very, at a very, very uh, less pressure, the partial pressure of water vapor is very, very low and uh, most of the dry air is uh, at atmospheric pressure and let me tell you that at atmospheric pressure, if you are at reasonable superheat, even steam still will behave as a, a reasonably good ideal gas. So, you can actually get to the steam tables and you know calculate the properties. If you are reasonably superheated above 100 degrees, even at atmospheric pressure, you will see that the ideal gas behavior still remains. So, I mean finally, what are oxygen and uh, nitrogen? They are reasonably superheated. Even you can draw a dome for them and figure out where it will behave like an ideal gas and where it will not behave like an ideal gas. But at atmospheric pressure, there is a reasonable good ideal gas kind of behavior irrespective of anything. Thank you. Number 1 6. What is the practical usefulness or the significance of entropy? We have been making these calculations uh, for many of these systems, engines and turbines and uh, such, but what is real, what is really the usefulness of uh, this number? Yeah, so, uh, so, from an engineering point of view, we take entropy purely to see whether a uh, process that you have defined is practical or not. So, for example, you can create any process that you want, but whether it will really happen or not is what we are interested in it. And you can be sure that if it is an adiabatic process, then unless the entropy remains the same or increases and in all practical purposes it should increase, then we can say, okay, this is a process which is possible. And let me tell you, you can invent any kind of process and you can believe that it may happen, but I am telling you most processes would not happen just because you think that they may happen. And the use of entropy is only to see whether that process will happen or not. Now, in cases of turbines and compressors, uh, it is also used to figure out how, uh, how much we are deviating from a very efficient engine or an efficient turbine. So, there is something called an isentropic efficiency and if you are very close to the isentropic efficiency, that means you are, uh, you assume an adiabatic turbine and if uh, you can maintain uh, the entropy same, then you can get the maximum work output. So, the farther away from isentropicity you are, the less work output you get and hence you can always think that yes, I have a machine which is not that great and how is it that I can get clo closer to the isentropic situation. So, the, again this is a practical use, you know that you can work on something which is not totally out of the world and still try to go towards isentropicity. So, that is the whole idea, it is just for our engineering sake, we need to know how close to practical uh, uh, or how close to implementation we are. Thank you. How it can be helpful or useful to evaluate the efficiency or the performance of any system. Uh, for instance, uh, again, if we, dig, uh, if we dig further into it, uh, entropy can be again associated or related with volume as well as state of order or disorder. So, for instance, if I have a, I have a system or I have a certain amount of matter or gas and if I increase or decrease the volume. Uh, in essence, uh, increase or decrease the state of order or disorder. I don't really see any value in it in the sense that one will be more efficient or will have more sense of orientation so as to derive or achieve more efficiency from the system. So that's my primary uh, contention on it. Okay, so let me let me give you an example. See, uh, just uh, you know, uh, just following this uh, uh, thing that there is order and disorder will not help you so much. But I, I, I tend to give a regular example that let us assume that you have a stone and there are 10 people pushing it and all of you are pushing in different directions. The stone is not going to move too far off or maybe it will never move. But if all of you stand on one direction and start moving, 
pushing it, you will all have put the same amount of effort, but would have moved the stone far away. So, that is the kind of thing that you, you get if you try to evaluate entropy. Okay. So, I have a turbine, okay. if I ensure that the entropy remains the same, you yourself can see from the steam table that I will get the maximum work output. If I start increasing the entropy, your work output will decrease and you know that you are not doing something so correct and you can try to get towards the maximum or the isentropic case and you will ensure that you can get as great work output as possible and that is it is just an engineer's way of looking at it, this is what we can do. So, a regular physicist will probably never find a use for entropy, but as an engineer we realize that there is this ideal situation and if we get as close to it as possible, we will get maximum work output from a heat engine and we should try to go there. So, that is the most practical use of entropy that you can think of. Thank you. Hello, sir. Sir, one question I want to ask regarding the cyclometry chart. You have taught us the cyclometry chart in the previous session. One very important thought about the cyclometry chart is that it is very useful under the conditions of normal atmospheric pressure. We are having any two values and we can calculate each and every value of cyclometric properties. If the value of atmospheric pressure is changed under those situations, can you explain me how this chart will be useful for us to calculate the different properties of vapors like that? I think I have already repeated this point two, three times that th this is the only reason that we are uh, emphasizing steam tables. That is because we do not want you to use the psychrometric chart in a thermodynamics course. The psychrometric chart can be used only at regular one atmospheric pressure. So, for example, if you go to a hill station and the pressure is only 90 kilo Pascal, you will have to make a different psychrometric chart which will be used only there. Okay. So, whereas if you have the steam tables, you will have no such problem. So, right now the emphasis is please use the steam tables, do not look at the psychrometric chart because that can be used only at one atmospheric pressure. If the pressure is you know even 10 percent off, then sorry you cannot use that chart at all. So, thank you. My yes. question is that that adiabatic process in psychrometry is uh, correlated with the constant WBT and enthalpy constant. How it is correlated? In? So, I think uh, again I have probably answered this question earlier. Uh, the adiabatic wet, uh, wet bulb temperature is an adiabatic process, it is not necessarily a constant uh, wet bulb temperature. Okay, there is only a very small difference when you plot it on the psychrometric chart and hence people tend to think that these two lines are the same, but these two lines are not really the same. They are actually different things. They are no, you can just see that the difference arises because uh, if you change the specific humidity in a certain range, it is not going to change the enthalpy too much. So, that is why you think that it is nearly a constant uh, uh, wet bulb temperature line, whereas in, in reality it is not correct. Thank you. 1088, go ahead. Sir, this is regarding the velocity of sound and psychometry. So, it is given that the velocity of sound uh, is given by the Newton's formula Laplace correction. It is the under root gamma bulk modulus of medium upon the density of the air. So, it is practically found that the velocity of sound is more or uh, travel faster in a moist air than a dry air. So, the question is that the velocity is inversely proportional to under root of uh, density of uh, air. So, it is a faster in a moist air and it is a less in a dry air. So, how the density is a less than dry air, moist air density is a less than dry air. Actually, the way I understand it is um, if you are dealing with moist air, you will have some, uh, some amount of liquid also present along with, uh, with, with the air and uh, consequently the mixture that you are dealing with will have uh, properties very different from that of, uh, of the air. And in fact, if you see, if you are dealing with a pure liquid sort of a situation, the speed of sound is much, much higher than what is it in, in air. I mentioned that in air it is roughly about 350 meters per second, but if you look at uh, liquid, it goes to something like 1500 meters per second. 
So, moist air is something in between these two uh, extremes is what I will say and therefore, the speed of sound would actually be higher than 350 meters per second, but less than 1500 meters per second. Uh, this is what I would uh, I would like to mention. Thank you.